I am here with the great uh, Kellyanne Conway, my dear friend, uh, former uh, special counselor to President Trump. Kellyanne, um, we're going native here, so it's great fun. Uh, what do you make of this whole story? Let's start with this special prosecutor, special counsel. What do you make of it? What I make it of is what America will make out of it, which is more politics. You can't have a Department of Justice who just a year ago referred to concerned parents as school board members as, quote, domestic terrorists, and feel that America will have confidence in the competence of the Department of Justice to handle this. They're calling this independent. They're saying they need to push it out because both Trump and Biden have declared their intentions to run for president again. But that's not going to be good enough for people who wonder why the, we, the taxpayers, have footed the bill mm. for over six years now, Larry, on every investigation President Trump mentioned in his statements. I want people out there to understand you're paying for this. Mm. Uh, you can't afford basic necessities in your household, and you as a taxpayer are paying for all of these investigations, all of these... Um, promises of indictment, all these subpoenas and scandal opera and everything that they claim is going on. Uh, on the one hand, it may create more sympathy for President Trump and make him look more like a victim. Um, on the other hand, uh, maybe this person will produce something that they think they can use politically to get his way. But here's the question I have for the Democrats. If you're not worried about Donald Trump, if you know that in a cage match or rematch with Joe Biden, you got him, you can beat him, he can never, he, we're going to run against the one, for one Republican who can't beat Joe Biden, then why are you doing all this? Right. And stop telling me because democracy is on the ballot and rule of law because they flout their they flout their um, selves at rule of law all the time. I also last point, Larry. I see this as a continuation of the campaign strategy in these midterms we just witnessed from the Democrats. The Republican Party came up short in some places and spaces, but we can live with ourselves in going out and respecting the voters' will as expressed in the polls, that they are concerned about inflation, high cost, high crime, education, border security, Putin and all the rest. The Democrats were out there, including with their best messenger, Barack Obama, the guy from Hope and Change, instead of talking about that, pointed his finger at America, scolded us, smeared some Americans, scolded most of us, scared us. Democracy's on the ballot. Jim Clyburn talking about Nazism and Hitler. This is a continuation of that. Everything seems so purely political to them now, uh, about them now. And this should surprise no one, but I think people have also lost count of how many special prosecutors, counsel, uh, investigations, et cetera. Those who put in with Mueller, those who put in with the two impeachments, those who put in with the SDNY, those who put in with Tish James, those who put in with this, that, and the other, uh, Russia collusion, of course, delusion, illusion, they're going to put in with this. And don't confuse all the naysayers and critics, the professional Trump haters, with the majority of Americans who want our government, which includes our current DOJ, to focus on the issues that are perplexing, perplexing and vexing them. So what is, look, the Republicans have the House. In fact, by the way, the latest tally is they'll have 222 seats. So they, that's, that's fine. Um, they're going to do something about this. They'll have some oversight. I mean, Jim Jordan runs the Judiciary Committee, for example. And they're going to look at this and the politicalization of the Justice Department and using it as a political weapon. I mean, this is not going to be... They're not, Democrats are not going to get off scot-free on this. And you're right. There may wind up a, a wave of sympathy for Trump because it's so clear that the Bidens are using everything they can. I mean, it's like LBJ. It's like Richard Nixon. Hate to say it, but you know, Nixon went used his government or tried to. This not. I don't think this is going to fly. Probably it likely won't fly. But to your point, if we have 222 Republican members in the majority, which is great. Uh, I, of course, are going to have investigations. They should investigate things like border and the origins of COVID, perhaps maybe where we underreacted, where we overreacted on that. Certainly, they're going to do Hunter Biden. But um, I would also ask these Republicans to make sure that they're making good on their promises to be pro-growth yes. and pro-energy yes. independence and do something where people are truly suffering inflation, border security, physical and financial security, et cetera. But sure, they can, they can do all of this and more. And taking that gavel out of Nancy Pelosi's hand yesterday and giving it over to Jim Jordan, giving it over to Kevin McCarthy, giving it over to Jim Com James Comer mm -hmm. on oversight, uh, people are starving for less one-sided Washington, one-party control of Washington, because they want to see some checks and balances. Checks and and balances. these investigations and oversight hearings would provide the checks and balances. And ladies and gentlemen, these are public and transparent. You're paying for those hearings, too. Tune in if you'd like to tune in and see what's really going on once somebody's under the Klieg lights. Yeah, the Republicans have to show that they're going to be the stewards of economic yes. prosperity, among other things. So, speaking of one former steward of economic prosperity, what did you think 
of former President Trump's speech on Tuesday. Well, I love how much he stuck to policy, America first policy at that. Uh, if he, this is about issues and not individuals, or if, if it's about policies and not just personalities, and frankly, if it's about first principles and not just politics, he's got a good chance of winning. And uh, now that means everything else gets stripped away and Donald Trump is able to articulate to America how life was under him and how life is under Joe Biden. His achievements. His achievements are many. We're here at America First Policy the Institute to celebrate those. Biden. Total contrast. Larry, I've never seen such a bright line distinction between two political parties mm -hmm. and their agendas and their record of accomplishments. And so that's what he needs to say. I mean, his argument to the, to the public, he's pressing the case that I'm the guy who made it great, and I'll do it again. No trash talk. I love no trash no talk. No trash right? talk, and less of that on Truth Social and, would be just fine. And <laughs> no 2020 election denial talk. Very little back because he knows. New Trump. No. Is it a new, new Trump? <laughs> I ask you. You know him very well. You talk to him even more than I do. New well, New Trump. Well, I think it's uh, the new New Old Trump meeting. The guy who <laughs> wants to go forward as he did the in 2015 and 2016. Trump. That's it. Yeah, that's the true. last time. Uh, you or I were involved in his political team. Last time I was involved with Donald Trump's political team was 2016. <laughs> Me too. And we won. Uh, so, but I say this because there was such a focus on policy then. It wasn't just empty promises. It was specific. Mm -hmm. When you came out with it, when he came out with his tax cut plan in September of 2016, when he did his, uh, he was up in Gettysburg talking about what he would do in the first 30 or 100 days. People want those specifics, and people, voters, Larry, will reward. Politicians, candidates who come out with specifics, with solutions, um, not pablum and not just problems. And he's got the record to do it. And I think people will put aside however they feel about this, that, and the other with him if he allows them the, the grace to talk about those accomplishments. Yes. And going for, I mean, it was very forward looking agenda. I mean, the, I hope he stays with it. Kept a okay. lot of his promises. I mean, I'm not time. endorsing. I'm not predicting. No, I'm just no. saying. There's a lot of unfinished stay, business, too. He, right. And, and he, what he's saying is, I want to come back. Look what they've done to our policies. Look what they've done to the economy. Look what they've done to a country in decline. And he wants to take another whack at well, that. Well, it sounds like he took some great lessons from the last couple of years. And it's clear that Joe Biden has not. He was asked the day after the midterms in a press conference, Mr. President, what would you do differently? And he said nothing. No, so now they're stuck with Biden and Harris on the ticket. Yay. That's the best part, I think, that came out of last Tuesday um, in that regard. And again, if he sticks to that. Um, but also, Larry, in less time than it takes to have a baby, this Biden-Harris White House has just unraveled so many great policies that were yes. working, and sometimes not based on ideo ideology, Larry Kudlow, based on spite. You can't tell me there's any reason other than spite to kill those Keystone Pipeline, other U.S. pipeline jobs and energy into it. It just seems like spite. Yeah. Why else would you do that? Donald Trump, Trump bad, did. I'm good. Right. And that's no way to run a country. No, it's not. No, it's not. That's, very, that's a great point. Um, last one. Um, you and I have always talked about this. Donors, the big donors, uh, big news story last night, okay? My, my good friend, Steve Schwarzman, and my friend Ronald Lauder, you know these guys, also Ken Griffith, the uh, hedge fund guy, I don't really know him. They're all out there saying they won't give any money to Trump. They won't give any money to Trump. What does that mean? Well, first of all, I've m known all three men here and there, and each of those three men has separately and privately said to me, thank you so much for 2016, meaning we're so glad Donald Trump was a president and everything that that meant. So if that's what he's running on, that I would say other people should give a second listen, if not a second look. Um, at least two of those are personal friends of his. So that, that's uh, got to hurt. But look, I think that those three gentlemen should be applauded as captains of industry, as successful American dream stories. But what I would say overall is that donors don't choose the nominees, voters choose the nominees. And uh, that's important to remember because Donald Trump did not have the big donors by and large in that's 2016, right. Right. and really not until the summer or the fall, Larry. Yet, in April 2017, there was this great article in Axios that talked about how Donald Trump had broken a record among small donors. Small donors. And I think he can do that again. His super PAC proved Aren't he can do it Aren't small donors more important? Well, that's the lifeblood. In a successful campaign, 
small donors are more important than the big shot donors. Hey, Larry, if, quote, democracy's on the ballot, yes, yes. small donors. But they in are. Constitution I mean, actually, Republic. I think the Democrats in the midterms may have done better with small donors than the Republicans. They did, they did very well, and they, they really were able to gin up their base, but they had no other choice in those last seven to ten days. They weren't reaching out to swing voters and independents necessarily in those last ten days. They were trying to gin up their base, which is why Obama's out there pointing his finger and scolding and scaring everyone. But on this, I mean, those three gentlemen are welcome to do what they want. Uh, I think people are saying who should be president next, not even knowing who will and won't run. And I just want to say, I'm going to go there here uh, with the GOAT, that you know, this whole nonsense of people who would never vote for Ron DeSantis or Donald Trump for president, trying to put them as two scorpions in a bottle, mm. trying to create division. The only thing Democrats seem unified on right now is dividing the country. Mm. And I, for one, am not going to allow that. Deron DeSantis and Donald Trump are men of similar accomplishments, mm -hmm. agenda, certainly leadership styles. Mm -hmm. I'm so happy, Larry Cutler, that we'll never go back, at least not now, to this ridiculous mealy mouth, mushy, gushy way of governing where we've got Republican leaders who want to be president, who are all docile and all withdrawn right. and all. You need somebody out there who's willing to articulate and fight on behalf of they're the American fighters. people. They're, they're fighters. fighters, but they don't, they don't need to be fighting with each no, other. It, I don't believe they are. It may be I think a, they're fighters for America. Really, uh, it may, these kinds. Of, we may be, all be surprised. There will be primaries. There may be very clean primaries. Okay, that's why I really like Trump without trash talk. Just talk about the issues. You're right. DeSantis is a very smart guy with a good conservative philosophy. So is Mike Pence. So is Mike Pompeo. So is Glenn Youngkin, right? We have a strong bench. We have a very strong bench. That's they just don't. They literally have Biden and Harris. They have I say anymore. I These wait. two people are always, your teleprompter isn't off. They're always fighting with the teleprompters, Biden and Harris, and the teleprompter always wins. <laughs> I got through it without a teleprompter. You got, you're Larry the Kudlow. You're not. <laughs> <laughs> Kellyanne Conway, the best of the best. Oh, my gosh. I think we're copacetic again here. Thank you for coming on, by the way.